Good morning, good morning. It's great to spend a bit of time with you again this morning. It's Farish and Baptist Church's online worship for Sunday the 29th of November. It's Advent Sunday, the first Sunday in Advent. You can tell, can't you? We've got a candle to hand. It's one of those times when even as Baptists we don't mind messing about a bit with candles. I, I think they're all right any time. I love a good candle. Although we're not together, we will be lighting this candle as the first candle of Advent. Maybe in the future we will be able to light them together. But for today, let's light this one. Maybe you want to light your own candle. I don't know. And remember Jesus, the light of the world coming into our world. Advent Sunday, of course, looks forward not only to Christmas and the coming of Jesus. We celebrate his historical birth, but the second coming, the coming again of the Lord Jesus. We've been thinking a bit about that in the last few weeks, haven't we? Dennis will be joining me a bit later on to lead us in prayer. We'll be looking at uh, both Mark and Isaiah and we will be hearing from God's word and we're going to worship him together. That's where we begin. And I'm really delighted that so many of you are joining in with the music that we use to worship God with on Sunday mornings. You will know that we are producing these ourselves and joining me this morning, Chris and Kate, some of the stalwarts, Abby and Julia, but also Claire and Leslie, you will hear this morning. Uh, at one point, you'll hear some of them along with the sampled sounds of the BBC Symphony Orchestra, no less. So I'm really grateful to those who are participating in this kind of way. I read this this morning. I thought it was interesting. You are invited to a time that is coming. The description is as follows. There will be no more death, no more mourning, no more crying, no more pain. For the new normal has passed away. Time? Well, to be announced. Join the meeting. You are in the Advent waiting room. Please wait to be connected. The Lord of hosts knows you are waiting. Let's anticipate all that is to come. Praise is rising. Hearts turning to our God in worship. Restore us, O God. Make your face shine upon us that we may be saved. Hosanna. Hosanna.
cry out to you, Father God, Hosanna, you are the God who saves us and you are worthy of all the praise and the honour that we can bring to you this morning and indeed any morning. We pray that you will draw us to yourself and forgive us that we are often not ready to hear you and to listen to you and to spend time with you. But we know that you are able to strengthen us in the waiting of worship. And in this season of Advent, we ask that you would draw close to us in your mercy and in your grace. We thank you that when we fall silent, when we are able to quieten the thoughts of our minds and the restlessness of our hearts, then you come to us through the Lord Jesus by your Holy Spirit in in such amazing ways and we we ask father that we would experience that this morning in our worship we thank you that you are the lord the god who made us the one who shapes us and who loves us we thank you that you are god of the light but also god of the darkness you are god of the day and god of the night we know that all things are in your hands and so we come to you and ask that we would be still before you and recognise this glorious truth that Jesus has come, is come and will come again. Hear our prayer and our praise, we ask, in the name of our Lord Jesus. Amen. As we continue to worship and as we listen and maybe sing along at home, let's be thankful that we can concentrate on the words of some of the songs and the hymns of the Christian church. We've not been able to sing together in the same place for eight months or so, and I know that hurts. A lot of us love being able to express worship to God, singing together and offering our lives to him in that way. But we're going to hear a song now sung by folks from our church. Join in if you know it's an old hymn based on the liturgy of St James to the tune Picardy, arranged by Ralph Vaughan Williams. There you go. 
You'd never know that part of my degree was uh, English church music and the history of, would you? But there you go. Uh, it comes out now and again. I love singing. I've had the privilege of singing in so many wonderful places, so many cathedrals around the uh, the country uh, in, in, uh, in choirs and so on. And, uh, and this is just a beautiful piece, but it, it helps us to concentrate on the words. Let's look at these beautiful words. Let all mortal flesh keep silence before God. Let's stand before him and recognise the awesome thing that has happened, that Jesus has come in bodily form into the world. And let us marvel. Let us be struck with awe. Let us wonder at the glory of our God and the beauty of the Lord Jesus. Let all mortal flesh keep silence. Let all mortal flesh keep silence and with fear and trembling stand. Ponder nothing earthly-minded, for with blessing.
Hear us, Shepherd of Israel, you who lead Joseph like a flock, you who sit enthroned between the cherubim, shine forth before Ephraim, Benjamin and Manasseh. Awaken your might, come and save us. Restore us, O God, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. How long, Lord God Almighty, will your anger smoulder against the prayers of your people? You have fed them with the bread of tears. You have made them drink tears by the bowlful. You have made us an object of derision to our neighbours and our enemies mock us. Restore us, God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Let your hand rest on the man at your right hand, the son of man you have raised up for yourself. Then we will not turn away from you. Revive us and we will call on your name. Restore us, Lord God Almighty. Make your face shine on us that we may be saved. Restore us, O oh God. Turn your face towards us. What a prayer that is for Advent. For we look to God to be saved and revive us. We've just been hearing that, haven't we, from Psalm 80. Revive us that we might call upon the name of the Lord. Advent is a time for us to examine ourselves, to be prepared over the past few weeks We've been hearing how we should live in the light of the return of Jesus. We should expect that, anticipate it, and be working in this world for God's kingdom to come. And that has to happen in us first. That's why we pray for revival. We're going to light this Advent candle. If you've got one that you want to light yourself, please do that now as a sign, not just that Jesus is the light of the world, but that he is our light. That we seek him, that we are his people, and we want to live lives that reflect that in every way. Let's hear again words from Jesus reminding us how near his return is. Jesus said, But about that day or hour, no one knows. Not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Be on guard. Be alert. You do not know when that time will come. It's like a man going away. He leaves his house and puts his servants in charge, each with their assigned task, and tells the one at the door to keep watch. Therefore, keep watch, because you do not know when the owner of the house will come back, whether in the evening or at midnight, or when the cock crows, or at dawn. If he comes suddenly, do not let him find you sleeping. What I say to you, I say to everyone, watch. So let's test ourselves, shall we? Let's see how ready we are for Jesus. We want to be a church a group of people, a community of God's people who are committed to Jesus and to one another. And we want to get better and better at that. Did you know that our church logo helps us to understand and gives us a, a pattern, if you like, trying to work out where we are in our relationship with the Lord Jesus and with one another? Last week, you may have noticed at the end of our service, this new ident. Well, there's more to it than that. Here's our church logo as we know it and we love it. And it's made up of a number of different parts. 
Let me explain. Our church logo tells you everything you need to know about Faversham Baptist Church. Here's the cross of Jesus Christ right at the centre because Jesus is head of the church. He's at the heart of everything that we are and everything that we do. The inner circle on our logo represents the covenant people of God. People who are committed to Jesus and committed to one another in worship and prayer and daily living. It's what membership is all about. The middle circle you can see right there. It's the wider congregation of God's people, perhaps not yet ready to make that commitment to other people and to the Lord Jesus. And then beyond that, you can see coming up right now, the wider circle of the whole community. For anyone who's got any association at all with Faversham Baptist Church, and we value everyone. Everyone's important. But of course, we need to be working our way towards Jesus, towards the centre. So here's the question. Where do you fit in? Where do you belong? To the wider community? Are you part of the congregation? Are you making those steps towards Jesus or are you committed to Jesus and to one another within the life of the church? I'll leave that there just for a few moments so that you can decide where you fit in. So where are you? Where do you fit in? Are you moving closer and closer to Jesus? Are you a disciple wanting to orientate your life around the Lord Jesus? We're going to have that opportunity to hear God's word in a little while and think about how he can shape our lives. My prayer is that you will grow closer to him and will grow closer to one another and more of us will be committed together as covenant people, not just a, a, a church or congregation who congregate together now and then or, or the wider community, important though those things are, but that we will be a people truly committed to the Lord Jesus and to one another. We're going to spend a few moments now in prayer and Dennis is going to lead us as we pray. As we come to prayer, we're reminded that today is the first Sunday in Advent, when we once again welcome the babe in Bethlehem and celebrate this time together. We're reminded in our reading today that Jesus will come again and that we are to be ready and alert. So let's pray. In this advent of expectation, draw us together in unity, that our praise and worship might echo in these walls and also through our lives. In this advent of expectation, draw us together in mission, that the hope within might be the song that we sing and the melody of our lives. In this advent of expectation, draw us together in service, that the path we follow might lead us from a stable to a glimpse of eternity. The Advent story of hope and mystery, anticipation, preparation, the kingdom of this world and the next, and a saviour appearing when we least expect. Heaven touching earth, the footsteps of the divine walking dusty roads as once they did in Eden and a people searching for a saviour and walking past the stable open-eyed and hearts that this might be an advent of hope for the world. Amen. As we continue in prayer, coincidentally today marks the International Day of Solidarity with the Palestinian people, a country that's familiar to us through the Bible, uh, particularly towns in the West Bank, Bethlehem for instance, a country that's divided, a country that has seen conflict over the years, a country where the land 
given to the Palestinians has been increasingly become less and less with Israelis settling on land occupied by the Palestinians. And yet Christians are still active there. We have the Bethlehem Bible College. We have churches in Gaza that meet regularly for worship. 70 or 80 people coming together every Sunday, worshipping the Lord and trying every initiative possible to help their people, to find a zeal. We want to reach our people for Christ, they say. And as Christians, they can't stay silent about the injustices that are being committed. Can they stay silent about the suffering of the people? People who have been harassed for nothing. Little children who are being shot at for nothing. Christians really need to have a different outlook on the world and see the world through God's eyes. If they could forget all the politics they'd see people as people, as Israelis, Jews, Palestinians, Christians and Muslims, all through one lens without seeing black and white. And so we're asked to pray for that country, pray for the Palestinian Christians, that God would give them the wisdom to be the voice of peace, and at the same time to work diligently to bring the gospel to people who are in need of it. Pray that the Lord will use the church to be a vessel of change, in the whole nation. We also pray for the work of the BMS there as they give support to the Christians in that location and pray that God will continue to bless them as they seek to build bridges between themselves and the Israelis. That a final solution might be found to this divided country because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And finally, uh, as we come to prayer, let's pray for the ongoing pandemic, the coronavirus, particularly in the run-up to Christmas um, and with the news of the increasing the number of cases in our area, that God would protect us and keep us safe. Do join in the responses as appropriate. Lord Jesus Christ, we ask you to protect us from the spread of the coronavirus. You are powerful and merciful. Let this be our prayer. Have mercy on me, my God. Have mercy on me. For in you I take refuge. I will take refuge in the shadow of your wings until the disaster has passed. Jehovah Shalom, Lord of Peace. Remember those living in coronavirus hotspots and those currently in isolation. May they know your presence in their isolation your peace in their turmoil, and your patience in their waiting. Prince of Peace, you are powerful and merciful. Let this be our prayer. Let's respond. May your mercy come quickly to meet us, for we are in desperate need. Help us. God our Saviour, for the glory of your name. God of all comfort and counsel, we pray for those who are grieving, reeling from the sudden loss of loved ones, May they find your fellowship in their suffering, your comfort in their loss, and your hope in their despair. We name before you those known to us who are vulnerable and scared, the frail, the sick, and the elderly. God of all comfort, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. He has delivered us from such a deadly peril, and he will deliver us again. On him we have set our hope that he will continue to deliver us. Jehovah Rapha, God who heals, we pray for all medical professionals dealing today with the intense pressure of this crisis. Grant them resilience in weariness, discernment in diagnosis, compassion upon compassion, as they care. 
We thank you for the army of researchers working steadily and quickly towards a cure. Give them clarity, serendipity and unexpected breakthrough today. Would you rise above this present darkness as the sun of righteousness with healing in your rays? May this be our prayer. Let's respond. Sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. God of all wisdom, we pray for our leaders, the World Health Organization, national governments and local leaders too. Heads of schools, hospitals and other institutions. Since you have positioned these people in public service for this hour, we ask you to grant them wisdom beyond their own wisdom to contain this virus. Faith beyond their own faith to fight their fear and strength beyond their own strength to sustain vital institutions through this time of turmoil. God, all wisdom and counsel, you are powerful and merciful. May this be our prayer. Let's respond. God is our refuge and strength and ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. I bless you with the words of Psalm 91. Surely he will save you from the fowler's snare and from the deadly pestilence. He will cover you with his feathers and under his wings you will find refuge. His faithfulness will be your shield and rampart. You will not fear the terror of the night, nor the arrow that flies by day, nor the pestilence that stalks in the darkness, nor the plague that destroys at midday. A thousand may fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. Let's respond. Answer me when I call you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. May Al Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty who loves you, protect you. May Jesus Christ, his Son, who died for you, save you. And may the Holy Spirit, who broods over the chaos and fills you with his presence, intercede for you and in you for others at this time. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory for ever and ever. Amen.
You may have seen the TV programme The Repair Shop. If you haven't, it's a programme where members of the public bring much cherished family heirlooms that have seen better days and they are restored to their former glory by some of Britain's finest restoration experts. Now I'm not surprised that it's such a hit. It seems so in tune with the times, doesn't it? Reduce, reuse, recycle. It's an antidote to the throwaway culture we live in. But I think it goes a bit deeper than that. We love the idea of being made new, of being renewed. It does not take an expert to work out that the world is pretty broken. Not just this year, which has been such a year, but as we look around, we see so many things that just aren't right and aren't good. And for those of us who are living privileged lives, it's important to remember the brokenness of the world. But it's not just the world that is broken. The world is broken because we are broken. This is something that none of us like to address. You see, we can understand that we're broken, but the fact that we might have something to do with that brokenness is very hard to swallow. You see, my brokenness isn't just caused by other people. It's so easy to blame someone else, anyone else, sometimes everybody else. But to face up to the fact that I have something to do with my own brokenness is not easy. It's never my fault. Probably seen the ad for Tesco this Christmas with people worried about the fact that they might be on the naughty list. And Tesco says, don't worry, this year there is no naughty list. Well, I have to remind myself that there is a naughty list and I am on it because I am the architect of my own downfall. I contribute to the problems of the world because there is something in me which is all around us and that is what the Bible calls sin. And this idea is one of the things that Isaiah picks up in chapter 64. We'd love to be free from sin, but Isaiah points out that it is a continual struggle. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. As when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil, come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. But when we continued to sin against them, you were angry. How then can we be saved? All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts are like filthy rags. We all shrivel up like a leaf, and like the wind our sins sweep us away. No one calls on your name or strives to lay hold of you, for you have hidden your face from us and have given us over to our sins. Sin creates problems in our lives and in our relationships and Isaiah shows us this is basically because sin puts a barrier between us and God. Because of sin we don't want to pray and then God cannot hear us though he loves to do so. And the barrier is widened and certain if we continue to act in rebellion against God. Isaiah sums up this dilemma in just a few words. Shall we be saved? He asks. In effect, it's a question that has some real depth to it. If we are sinful to the core and continually go our way and not God's way, well, what hope actually is there? If God can't hear us because of our sin and because of his holiness, what hope is there? How can we be saved? But there is good news really good news. Isaiah 64 is a little bit like God's repair shop. God is the master at taking our broken world and restoring it, at taking broken lives and renewing them, reshaping them, recreating them. 
And the question is, do you want a life that is in the hands of the master craftsman? A life that is shaped by the God who created you and loves you and can remake you. Earlier on, we heard in Psalm 80 that cry, restore us, O God Almighty, make your face shine on us that we may be saved. So here is the good news. And it comes in three parts. God wants to work for you. God wants to work on you. And God wants to work with you. Since ancient times no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. In the last few weeks we've been concentrating quite a bit on what we do in response to what God has done for us and the fact that if Jesus is returning then we mustn't be lazy, we need to be alert and awake. Jesus is coming back, look busy and all that. And yes, of course, we want to serve him as a response to the love that he has. We want to be good sheep as we were seeing last week. But it's a mistake to think it's about us and what we do. It's not about our work at all. In a recent survey, one of the verses that people could recall off the top of their heads, the most popular ones, was God helps those who help themselves. There's just one problem with that. It isn't a verse from the Bible. In fact, it is not a biblical concept at all. Acts 17 verse 35 says, God is not served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all humanity life and breath and everything. You see, you don't serve him. He wants to serve you. This is an amazing concept that Isaiah gives us in chapter 64. 2 Chronicles chapter 16 verse 9. The eyes of the Lord range throughout the earth. What is he looking for? To strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. People who are turned to him, people who are looking to him. One of the versions says his eyes run to and fro. He's looking for someone to work for. He's so strong. He's so self-sufficient. He's overflowing with energy. He's saying, where is somebody I can show myself to? Someone, someone I can work for. Psalm 50 verse 15 says this. Call upon me in the day of trouble. I will deliver you and you shall glorify me. You're the one who has needs. God doesn't call on you when he needs help. You call on him when you need help. He shows up. He does wonders. Then you spend the rest of your life eternally glorifying him. That's the deal. He works for you. You glorify him. You get the joy. You get the help. He gets the credit. He gets the glory. That is the deal. God never hangs out a help wanted apply within sign saying I, I can't run my shop if you don't show up. So the gospel is no help wanted, help is available. And it's even more than that. God's running out of the shop and chasing me down the street. He's saying I've got help for you. Don't you want it? I want to help you. Stop. Don't run away from me. God is a God who works. For us. He wants to work for us. Let me ask you a few questions. Did we work to be created so that we could see? I was looking at my cereal this morning. I was eating my cereal, looking down to the bar, thinking, I can see, I can see. Thank you. Lord, thank you that I can see. Did I do that? Did I make myself see? Did you do it? You didn't do it. Did you make your ears so that you can hear the sweetest sounds and music and speech? Do you make your tongue to taste the sweetness and your mouth to smell the bacon and the toast? You didn't. Did we supply the earth with water for drinking? Did we make the sun or station it at a perfect distance from the earth so that we could swing in perfect rotations, that there would be day and that there would be night with temperatures that are at least manageable? for all the growth of the trees and everything else. No, you didn't do that. Did you surround the earth 
with air to carry the clouds and the birds and the oxygen for your lungs. You didn't do that either. Do we paint the sunrise or the sunsets that come up every day? No, they don't just come up every day. They come up every minute somewhere in the world. There's always a sunrise, always a sunset happening somewhere in the world. And God is doing every single one of them, not you. You don't have anything to do with that beauty at all. And it meets your needs profoundly morning and evening if you have eyes to see it. When we come to die, will all our labour and work help us? Will we make it possible for God to equip us for our sins and take away our fear and our pain and our guilt and give us new resurrection bodies someday forever and ever? No, 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 it won't. In other words, all the things that we need the most and love the best, we did not do. We did not make. Our work is not the key. His work is the key. And I want to leave this ringing in your ears. As Isaiah says in chapter 64, God works for those who wait for him. But God does not just work for you. God works on you, or at least he wants to work on you. Yet you, Lord, are our father. We are the clay, you are the potter. We are all the work of your hand. Do not be angry beyond measure, Lord. Do not remember our sins forever. Oh, look upon us, we pray, for we are all your people. I don't know if you've ever visited the Royal Porcelain Works at Worcester. You're first taken into a showroom and there displayed the finished products of the potter's skill and labour and the range and scope of beauty and loveliness that the potter has created. It's breathtaking. The almost unlimited variety of workmanship of the potter, not two pieces exactly alike. If God is our potter, it means that there's only one of me. God says to us, I don't want to make you like anybody else in the universe. I want to make you something different from everybody else. And he graciously persuades us to give ourselves up to him, to let him make us the one unique, unrepeatable person that he wishes us to be. He wants to work on us like a potter works on his clay. There's something that God wants to do with you and to make of you of each one of us that will reveal his glory in a way that nobody else does. We spent time in the showroom and now the guide asks us to follow him and he leads us through a door out into the works. What a change. We're now amidst the noise and the splash of water and dirt and clay and he directs our attention to a shelf where there are some half dozen lumps of what might be described as glass and chalk and they're different forms of clay. And all that you have seen inside there, he says, pointing to the showroom, has been made out of these materials. What has made the difference to this shapeless lump of clay? Now this beautiful vessel, it's the potter. That's what the potter is for. We are the clay, says Isaiah, the thing of possibility only, formless. But the Lord God himself is the potter. He can take the clay and by his skill and his grace, he'll make it into a thing of joy and beauty forevermore. Our guide is leading us on. The next thing we see is the importance of fire to the potter's art. We cannot count how many times the porcelain has to be put into the fire before it's finished. But here's a remarkable thing. It was never put into the fire unshielded. It was always enclosed in a strong outer vessel, closely sealed, so that the fire did its work and yet no hurt came to the porcelain. Into the fire of trial and suffering, God our potter puts us all, but he never puts us in unshielded. Lastly, we are taken into another room and there the artists are all busy working with a black fluid which they're putting on to this beautiful pure white porcelain. And we say to our guy, what are they doing? Apparently they're disfiguring the porcelain. <laughs> they're putting on the guilt. 
When the porcelain goes into the fire, the black that we see upon it now will be transformed into guilt. There are times when we feel disfigured, when it seems that God has abandoned us. What is he doing to us? It hurts so much. Can we bear the fire? What is he doing? He's putting on the guilt. So God wants to work for you and he wants to work on you. But he won't do either of those things unless you're surrendered to him, until you recognise that you're desperate for him, until you recognise the brokenness in you is part of your sinful nature and you turn to him. You see, God wants to work with you, not against you. He wants to work with you. And how do we do that? Well, Advent is one period where we get to the heart of what is important. We wait on God for his purposes and his plans. We serve him. That's what a waiter does. He's there to serve, knowing that God will work for us and will work on us. Most of us would rather do anything other than wait. Some of us would rather do the wrong thing than wait. Waiting is the hardest thing to do, the hardest part of the Christian life. Thousands act who cannot wait. Yet we all spend a great chunk of our life waiting for things to happen. And it's maddening, isn't it? For every green light, it seems like there are five amber lights and a dozen red ones. We all have to wait whether we like it or not. If you want to do a fascinating Bible study, then find a concordance. That's one of those books that lists all the words in the Bible and tells you where you can find them. You can do it online these days. But if you search for the idea of waiting or for the word wait, you'll find over and over and over and over and over again, God's people are called upon to wait, be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Why? Why all this waiting? So that we can be all that God wants us to be, so that he can deal with our brokenness and our sin. This work of repair does not come quickly. It takes time and effort and care. And God is willing to do that for us. As we wait, he rearranges our priorities. He tests our faith. He refines our motives. He increases our gratitude. So the question for you this morning is, will you let God work in you? Will you let God work in you? The God who wants to work for you, the God who wants to work on you. Will you let him work with you and in you? Lord, we're done with fighting, we're done with resisting, we're done with doing it all ourselves and going our own way. We are sorry that we resist you and we ask now that you would accept us into your life. Lord Jesus, forgive us, we pray. We want you to work with us to work for us, to work on us, and yes, to work in us, to your glory, that we may know and all the world may know that Jesus Christ is Lord and Saviour. He is my Lord and Saviour. We pray in his name. Amen. Those who did
Once again, thank you so, so much for being with us this morning. I do value, I hope you value too, the opportunity we have to do this and to do it together, even though we are apart. Next week, we will be back in person at St Mary's Road in our church building, but we will be streaming our service live at 10.30. If you're going to come down to the church please check all the things that you will need to do. Remember to bring a mask with you. Remember that we need to socially distance. We won't be able to intermingle in any way. We have to respect the rules, which are quite strict. We're in tier three. Uh, please be very, very careful so that we can be completely COVID safe. Have a great week and may God bless you.